New York, New York. Largest city in the United States and financial capital of the world. It's the emblem of the modern metropolis. Melting pot of melting pots, immigration is inseparable from its history. More than a third of its eight million inhabitants were born outside the country. Everybody's here in the city for the same thing, to create a new life, to do business. The cohabitation of its countless communities is very impressive, but the cost of real estate has become a major obstacle to family life. The revitalization of rundown neighborhoods like Brooklyn and Harlem is a priority. It's been a gentrification from the inside out. People who live here, who know what's missing, and who took it on themselves to provide it. But New York is in perpetual motion. It has an energy that expresses a desire for constant renewal. I think that if New York is so dynamic, it's because it's such a competitive city. Recent changes in the city's infrastructure have given New York a fresh start. It is now very safe and extremely green. Located at the mouth of the Hudson River, New York, formerly New Amsterdam, has been an important hub of trade and commerce ever since its early days. The Dutch West India Company established it as a trading post. So it began as a kind of uh, commercial concern. It, it really started to make money. Uh, and that, it's been that way ever since. It's been that way ever since. It's a, it's a largely secular environment. <laughs> Who were the first settlers of New York? Well, the Native Americans, you know. Uh, the Muncie tribe, uh, which was part of the Lenape tribe, uh, they were here. And they were mostly hunting and fishing and trading. They were using it for commerce also. Rumor has it that the island of Manhattan was purchased from the Indians for today's equivalent of a few hundred dollars. Almost 400 years later, it's hard to know what the place would sell for. Even in the 17th century, it was ruled by real estate. Uh, there were always housing shortages in Manhattan because it's a skinny island, you know? And everybody was packed into this, this one area, basically. Uh, and then the Dutch started farms in Brooklyn. But uh, this, this notion of this limited land and everybody fighting for it, you know, that's, that's the story of the port, is this collision between port uses and real estate uses. But the Dutch were not in control for very long. No. Uh, the British wanted it. They uh, sent some uh, warships in uh, with cannons. And Peter Stuyvesant said, uh, we must defend uh, our land. And, uh, and the businessman said, nah, you know, let them have it. We'll still do business in the old way. So without an ounce of blood? There was not an ounce of blood. There was no fight whatsoever. And the British took over. Uh, and it was barely a ripple. Three days after the arrival of the British, New Amsterdam becomes New York, without a single shot fired. Where was the original port of New York? The port would largely started on the East River side of Manhattan, and eventually switched more to the Hudson River side of Manhattan. But one could think of this whole region as the port, you know? Uh, the Brooklyn side also had a lot of the port. I know, when you look at all the old pictures, there's boats docked around the entire island. Think of a super highway, endless, endless boats of all kinds just streaming down here. Uh, so it truly was a spectacle. So where did the port move to? The port moved to New Jersey uh, across the Hudson River, and it moved there because there was more uh, backspace for containerized shipping. Boats were unloaded by uh, what they called great bulk cargo, which is one man handing it to the next. Uh, you didn't need all this backspace. But when you got these super tankers, 
uh, you needed much more back space for these big containers to sit. And I would say by the 80s, most of the port was already in New Jersey with little pieces in Brooklyn and in Staten Island and nothing in Manhattan because Manhattan real estate is just way too uh, expensive and there are lots of things you can do with Manhattan real estate besides uh, docking containers. You know. And like in most cities, yeah. once the port has been relocated, yeah. yes. uh, it creates this barren space. Yes, an empty harbor, so to speak. Um, and that's when everybody sort of woke up and said, wow, we've got this whole waterfront. Why don't we do something with it, you know? Uh, but underneath it all, there was a sadness that something uh, that had really functioned well for centuries was no longer there. And when you're walking down, down Broadway or Fifth Avenue, a lot of times you're not conscious that you're actually on an island, you know? It's a very introverted mindset, so you don't think, oh my gosh, we're, we're on the water. But one of the things you'll notice, which is very odd about New York, is that it's very hard to actually get to the water properly. That is, it's very hard to stick your hand in the water. So here you have a promenade, um, but it's like, look, but don't touch. We're heading towards uh, Wall Street, and we're going under the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Highway. And one of the main problems in terms of public access to the waterfront is that these highways were built right at the edge. However it was done, there was going to be a problem because if it was done through the island, that would destroy a lot of neighborhoods. So they put them on the edge. There's a lot you could do under here, you know, but uh, they haven't figured it out yet or they don't want to do it. And so they put in these little dinky benches uh, and, uh, and these little dinky bushes. And the thinking has been, you know, we should make everything into a park. Uh, and there's been a reluctance to bring commercial activity to the edge. But New York is all about commercial activity. It shouldn't be afraid of commercial activity. It's why one comes to New York. One doesn't come to commune with nature. You know, one comes to be part of this kind of exciting environment. For entering the financial district here? Yes, yes. The so-called canyon, uh, because the streets are very narrow and the buildings are very tall. So you have a feeling like you are uh, walking through a canyon. The financial district encompasses the entire old city. Wall Street actually bears its name from the wall that was erected to protect the settlers from foreign attacks. When Dutch people created New Amsterdam, it was a commercial colony. And when English people took up the colony, it was to do business. It was a big port. So from the very start, you had people from all over the world. People say that in New Amsterdam, people spoke 18 different languages already. So do most New Yorkers speak English at home? Just half of them, four million people only. Two million people speak Spanish at home and then you have all the other languages. In certain Chinese or Latino neighborhoods, some people just don't speak English. So in order to help them, you are able to dial 311 for any question you want about the city. And you're on the phone and you can ask to talk in 170 languages. If you do that on the internet, it's 50 languages. It's really amazing. Many agencies who are here for people, publish documents to have them in seven languages, English and Spanish, of course, but also Chinese, Korean, French, uh, Creole, Italian, and Russian. How do all the different ethnicities cohabitate? Usually really well, of course. It's not paradise, it's real life. So you cannot say that there is no racism, that there is no competition, that there is no resentment or prejudices. That's the way it is. But everybody's here in the city for the same thing, to create a new life, to do business. There is no majority here, really none. Everybody's different and being different is what's normal. The mayor had made it very clear that 
uh, you are welcome, whoever you are, wherever you come from. Brighton Beach, nicknamed Little Odessa in reference to the Ukrainian city, is the ultimate expression of this cosmopolitan reality. An estimated 90% of the local population speak only Russian at home. So a lot of people coming from uh, Ukraine came in the 70s and 80s. They were Jews from that region who were allowed by the uh, ex-USSR to emigrate. People try to live the way they used to, even though things have uh, evolved and changed a lot in Russia. So those people try to keep what they had in mind about their home, their home country, their traditions, their, traditions, their identity. <laughs> I just asked him how he can work here if he doesn't speak any English, and he said, it's Brighton Beach. So what do you think? I think it's delicious. I want another one. <laughs> it's nice and crusty and melty inside. I love it. Is it really like in Russia? Oh, exactly the same thing. Exactly. In New York, you have so many, so many stores selling authentic things from the countries. When you go to Chinatown, people say that you have the best dumplings, the traditional way, because people keep the tradition the way it's supposed to be. You can go to Latin America, you can go to Asia, you can go to Russia, to, to Europe, to Japan. You can go anywhere in the world. And of course, Brighton Beach is also a beach. Let's not forget, we're still in New York City. the capital of multi-ethnicity in America, but it's also the epicenter of excellence. Finally, financially and culturally, the city has always attracted the best. This is really the city of contrasts. Yes, in many ways. All these people mush together, and unlike any other city, you know, in the country, you, you're with people. It's a very demotic city. You know, you're on the subway with people who are you know, millionaires and people who have nothing, you know, every day. And you're sort of forced to mix with people, and I think it's a really positive thing. How can New Yorkers be so completely democratic on the federal level, but repeatedly elect Republican mayors? Yeah, I mean, it's funny, you know, the, what you see as Republican mayors in New York City has a different definition than it would, uh, say, a, a Republican in, the South or something like that. Um, I think that uh, New Yorkers are very socially liberal. You know, people are very live and let live here. They're very tolerant. There's also a lot of wealthy people who don't want to pay taxes. Lots of people, you know, and so there's that draw. And I think also there's the sense of um, this is a city where it's incredible and wonderful and filled with incredible people, but there's also the, always that sense of there might be chaos. You don't want chaos to break out. And I think that the Republican mayors have often, especially Giuliani when he came in, he came in with this kind of law, law and order rhetoric. And I think that was attractive to people because especially at that time, you know, the city really felt lawless and felt scary. The last two mayors of New York dramatically changed the city. I mean, Giuliani cleaned it up, the cr crime-wise, and Bloomberg has, how do you say, greenified? Yeah, has, has <laughs> What's beautified the, word? the city, has made it more of a livable, walkable, bike rideable city. All of the things that make this city suddenly not just dominated by cars and taxi cabs and buses and make it more livable and walkable and bikeable for me have been great. You know, I used to be terrified to bike in the city. We tend to forget in a city of eight million people, you know, when we think about Wall Street, men in suits, women in suits, um, that, uh, that there is a family life here. Yeah, yeah, men in suits, hipsters, artists, everything like that. And then people like me who have fam families. You're married, you have kids, you lead lives that are, I think, for many people, you know, they would say, oh, that's not that much different from, uh, from my life, you know, if they're living in the middle of America. And you can do that in New York City. I mean, people don't believe it. It's different. You may not have a yard, but, uh, you know, this, this city for children is, 
incredible in many ways. The stuff for kids to learn and to see and experience. You know, when I think about that, my, what my daughter gets to see is incredible museums. The best artists, the best performers, you know, the best of culture comes here. Um, and I really like that. New York is the number one city where Americans want to live. Which is fantastic and, you know, it makes me feel better about the rest of the country. <laughs> that we have an inflated sense of our own importance and we think that everything that we do is fantastic and this is the most fascinating place in the world, but uh, well, it's, it, is. Uh, it is kind of it the is. most fascinating <laughs> place in the world, you know? New York has long been perceived as a polluted city, deprived of any real green spaces. But a large urban renewal project now drives the metropolis and impressive green spaces are popping up everywhere in the city. It's pretty amazing that in the biggest and the busiest city in America, you can now bike from Harlem all the way down the west side to Battery Park. And even to Coney Island. If you just hop over the bridge on your bike, which you can do, you can go all the way out. <laughs> It's been controversial. People don't like change and they don't want to be told where to drive and where they can't drive. But I think that more people are for it than against it as far as creating more bike lanes and changing traffic patterns. And, and they're, they're trying everything they can to make it a less car reliant city. After the addition of new pedestrian areas, like a car-free Times Square, New York has created more than 450 kilometers of bicycle paths. Inaugurated in 2009, the High Line Park extends over 2.3 kilometers, elevated above the Meatpacking District and the upscale neighborhood of Chelsea. These are old railroad tracks which were going to be demolished at a certain point. That's right. This structure was basically built to take the freight traffic off of the street. It was very dangerous. Um, it was built in the 1930s, and it was used only until 1980. We are right in the center of New York City. Yes, this is the thicket in the middle of New York. <laughs> it's amazing. See how quiet it is in here? It is incredibly so quiet. quiet. So we're literally floating over the city here. Yep, yep. So while this was abandoned, it was like a secret place for a while. People didn't even really you, notice it exists. You couldn't come up here. I mean, if you're down on the street, you could see this thing, but I think, honestly, it just kind of disappeared into the city landscape and the buildings. It was just this black thing, and some people would say, what is that? And some people who were more adventurous would find the stairs that were fenced off or climb out the windows of buildings that were adjacent to it. Um, but only a very few people knew what was up here. We always find amazing the number of people and the ways they find to use it that we never predicted. You know, we designed the elements and we designed the spaces, but New Yorkers and visitors just find what they want to do with it, and that's really amazing for us. There are performances, they have stargazing at night because the lighting is all down lighting, so there's no light pollution from the park, and it, in fact, makes this kind of dark zone in the city. People come up here at night to look at the stars. Um, they have food things going on up here. They have dance. They have a marching band. They, it's all kinds of stuff. A lot of cities are trying to figure out what to do with their former industrial pieces waterfronts, structures like this. And so New York is kind of ahead of the game in a lot of ways, but it's something that's happening all over the country and the world. On many levels, New York has always been a city of avant-garde. And it has been a magnet for artists from all over the country and the world. What's wild about New York is the people come here 
and then they are called to other parts of the country because you're in New York, people think you've made it. And so you get this level of talent and this level of people who really are highly skilled in what they do. I came to New York to be an artist, to dream, to, to dance, to play music. Once I got here, I realized I really loved writing plays, too. And so I was really fortunate I was able to get my plays produced here. How long did it take for you to make it big? <laughs> well, as I, you know, that's funny. I thought that it would take six months. I thought it would take me six whole months to be famous in New York. And, I mean, I, that was like 1976, so I, I guess uh, my, I was calculating a little off there, you know? And I don't really worry about that, because what you really find out in New York, it's not about being famous, it's about figuring out how to make a life for yourself. All the best of the best from the entire country come here. <laughs> the is world, there, the world. Not from the, the world, yeah, is yeah. there room for everybody? Yeah, if you come with this thing in your head, and it's going to go a certain way, and you want it to go a certain way, and when it doesn't, you feel like, oh my gosh, I failed. I don't know if it's failure to achieve something that's different than what you set out to achieve that you didn't expect. During the 70s, East Village was particularly run down, known for its low rents, but also for its rather dangerous character. Today, the neighborhood is a prime destination. So the East Village was kind of a, an intense place to uh, live. So we're right on the border of what's called Alphabet City, A, B, C, D. Uh, when I moved to New York in the 70s, C, D, Coke and Dope is what they were called, because it was like the center of the East Coast drug traffic. This is the building I lived in, right here. I live in the fifth floor, fifth floor walk up in this building, 120 East 4th Street. I just walked around, found this building, looked at three or four apartments and said, I'll take that one. That's what it was like. That's, you, it's not like that anymore. And now you have to go out to brokers, you have to do all kinds of stuff. Despite hard times, the area has long been home to New York's creative elite. Music, literature, painting, and theater, everything exciting and new was born in the East Village. Some of the best theater in New York has come out of this little block, because this is the little theater road. This is the neighborhood where La Mama, which is one of the great uh, theaters uh, in terms of off-off-Broadway, creating off-off-Broadway. The New York Theater Workshop is here. Uh, used to be Wonder Horse Theater over there. Is Broadway still the big thing? Yeah, it's a big thing. It helps drive the economy here. It's a place that people want to arrive at. It's one of the engines that drives New York City. What you see on stage is only part of it. You know, it's the backstage, it's the directors, it's the stage managers, the lighting, it's the designers, it's the industries that go with it, the wardrobe, the costumes, the people who come from all over the country to see Broadway plays. Recipient of numerous awards, notably for her work with Feist, choreographer Noémie Lafrance lives the complex realities of a career in New York. Her production company has new offices in a rundown warehouse where space is still somewhat affordable. All the windows were sealed with concrete. We stripped the floors and revarnished everything. You can see the old floor here. It was all in that state. This is the warehouse. The spaces we rent now are upstairs. But my project is to take over this whole space for production, a place where artists can produce their work. There isn't enough of that here. We want to buy the whole property in order to develop it. It'll probably happen in five or 10 years. But there's something beautiful in this architecture. We want to preserve it as a landmark of New York. Promoters prefer to demolish these old buildings and build high-rises because there's more money to be made. It's much easier to build something new than to fix the old. Except that when it happens, you lose the existing architecture, which is part of the local heritage. Uh. 
I think that if New York is so dynamic, it's because it's such a competitive city. There are all kinds of people who do all sorts of things here. So the question is, how do you stand out? How do you continue to be interesting? There's certainly the hope that if you come to New York, you'll be discovered. But in reality, it's quite the opposite. You come to New York to discover yourself, because it takes a lot of work. And most artists work two or three jobs in addition to their art, so everyone finds his or her niche in this environment. There are many actors who work in restaurants. There are many artists like me who have built spaces and sublet parts of that space to others, using real estate as a source of revenue in order to cope with all the expenses, including rent, which is very high. I have friends who came to New York who arrived in their 20s like me. I think it's easier at that age. In your 30s and 40s, it's much harder because you realize, I can't live in an apartment that's the size of a closet. When you're 20 years old, you say, okay, fine. It can be hard because the standard of living decreases for a European or even a Canadian who comes here. We have to find ways to adapt to the cost of living. You can always cope when you're alone, when it's just you. But when you have a family, things become more complicated because you need certain things. And when your child is two years old and you want to find a daycare, you have to be willing to pay more than $12,000 a year. It's a lot of money. Cost of living is very high indeed. But surprisingly, many families with young children choose to stay in New York. Harlem, north of the city center, is redefining itself and becoming once again a family neighborhood. It's another city. Colors change, smells change, the way people approach you on the street changes. Those are all very significant in how you make a life. people in Harlem are very hospitable. Yes, they are. People in Harlem are hospitable because uh, for the past 80 years, most of them have come from places where they've lived much slower lives, kind of a village life where people talk to each other. Hey, how you doing? All right. We like you and Edward. We've seen each other around. But ain't no place like New York. How long you been here? 30 years. This neighborhood is all right. It used to be bad, though. It increased all the drugs, sir. Well, this was drug street here. It used to be. You got my pretty smiles and stuff. At a certain point, this was the hub of American musical culture. Absolutely. It was. Because Amer it, was, it was the real encounter between America and Europe. And since so much of American culture was black, when the black immigrants came from the South, they brought their music with them, which was, you know, what you call roots music, what later became jazz, what started off really as being blues, three chord blues. I, I would say the downturn probably started with the Second World War when a lot of the men went off to fight and then in the 50s and 60s, as America was rebuilding, public monies didn't go towards cities. It went towards building suburbs. You know, that was the expansion of American suburbia. And so Harlem and the rest of New York was having a hard time throughout the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And it's like, you know, if uh, Manhattan sneezes, Harlem gets pneumonia. So everything that is bad is multiplied, of course, in Harlem. So what happened in the 60s and 70s is a lot of the drugs, it was also the beginning, of course, of the drug culture, and a lot of the drugs coming into New York were being cleaned up downtown and basically storehoused uptown. So this became the place where people came to buy drugs, and where, where there's drugs, you start to have addicts, and we have addicts, you have crime, and 
And so the whole thing just multiplied to the point where in the 70s, a lot of the brownstones were being given away for a dollar. My brownstone in 2003, when we got it, it had um, five rumors. Two of them died in their rooms, and, and one of them left, and now we have one left. And she has been in the building for 42 years. Just getting the paint off this fireplace took six months, two guys. Each floor, there are two fireplaces, one in the front and one in the back. So five and five. There was an entree here with a door here and a door here. And you walked in here and there was a wall that went from that spot to that spot and completely divided this in two. It's going to take a long time to do this. But that's part of it. You don't want to do something like this quickly. With time, it makes it what it's supposed to be also, because you're restoring something that was already there. And the real idea is to save something for the future. It's not really mine or for me. I'm passing through. The house was here before I was. We're on 125th Street right now, so this is the new center. Yes, 125th is really like the main street of Harlem. And so it has gone on and slowly been built up by different people. But since 2008, the city of New York has created a zoning plan. So obviously the stakes are very high for 125th Street and whatever happens to the future will impact the rest of Harlem. Revitalization is also well underway outside the island of Manhattan. Brooklyn now attracts many families looking for a more affordable living environment. In the early 90s, Jan Rosenberg chose to move away from the unaffordable city center. She moved to the neighborhood of Flatbush with her husband and two children. This was seen as this remote, far away place. And people didn't even know it was dangerous. I mean, they didn't know anything about it. But we quickly found out it was dangerous. And a lot of Brooklyn and a lot of New York was dangerous then. My husband and I were part of a block watch group. We used to go with flashlights and walkie talkies and walk up and down the street, trying to make sure the bad guys wouldn't come to our block. There was no place to eat here. There was no place to shop here. There was nothing on our commercial strip that was drawing local people here. Everyone who could shopped outside the neighborhood. But the more I looked into it, the more I wanted to make something happen. And I felt we could because it was such a small, sorry commercial strip. That was really my goal, was new life in our neighborhood. What I would say has saved the city in my experience is the reduction in crime. That's what's made it possible for people to live here without feeling under siege, for people to walk at night, to take the subway home, to let their kids play outdoors. I think safety and gentrification go hand in hand, and I think better goods and services and better schools go with gentrification. I'm more one of the people who celebrate gentrification when it doesn't tip a neighborhood, when it, it somehow manages the, to preserve the mix of people that are there. <laughs> Younger people don't have the money to move to the Upper West Side, the Upper East Side, Soho. So now we're talking about super gentrification, where the ultra wealthy are pushing out the relatively wealthy. Right. The ultra wealthy have uh, taken over lots of neighborhoods. When we talk about Manhattan, mm. is that sustainable? Is it sustainable? It's sustainable if you're rich. Um, is it sustainable over the long haul? I'm sure it'll reinvent itself if it needs to. That's what cities do. What's amazing about many cities is people move to the suburbs so that they can be close to the center of the city. But in this case, people are moving out of Manhattan and they are not going back to Manhattan. They are forming their communities here in Brooklyn and other areas. That's true. Well, this neighborhood was built as a suburb in the city. 
uh, but this has become more of a self-contained neighborhood and self-sustaining. Many of the new businesses, almost all of them, have been opened by people who live in the neighborhood. It's been a gentrification from the inside out. People who live here, who know what's missing, and who took it on themselves to provide it in one way or another. How far are we right now from Manhattan? 35 minutes from Union Square on the wonderful Q train. <laughs> and very close driving if you go through the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel. It's a 10 minute ride yeah. to Lower Manhattan. One of the things that attracts people here is how much it seems not like New York. The sidewalks, the trees, the grassy front yards, all of that um, suggests most of America, but not New York City. Ditmas Park is home to the largest concentration of Victorian houses in America. But with the economic crisis, rising crime, and the exodus of the population, these beautiful homes were unfortunately neglected. Luckily, the neighborhood has now become extremely coveted. What would a family-sized home in Manhattan go for these days? Well, millions of dollars. Apartments are going for millions of dollars. So uh, what, a five, six-bedroom house with a separate dining room, a big living room, a great big kitchen, um, five million, uh, six million. You know, it depends on the neighborhood, it depends on the condition, and so on. But uh, this kind of space is an enormous luxury. And here, it's a much more affordable luxury. This house is a five-bedroom Victorian house with some wonderful original details. Now that this area has picked up again, what would a house like this go for? Well, this house just went, so that's an easy question to answer. It was listed at a million two seventy-five, and in less than two weeks had several offers, two very close to that, and one right there, all cash. So that's the price. What would this house have been worth twenty years ago? Say, maybe three hundred thousand dollars. It's increased by a million dollars. Right, the house might have been the same. This house is not that renovated, but the, the neighborhood has improved so much that people really want to live here now. Despite his reluctance to leave the city, Miro, artist, teacher, and father, recently purchased the house next door. He converted the garage into a studio. One of the reasons for moving here was that I can have my studio near my house, Practically, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, for the price of a two-bedroom apartment uh, seven minutes away, you can get a Victorian with a piece of land. So there is a certain quality that you don't find in places that are already overdeveloped. In recent years, a new trend has transformed the city. Urban agriculture. From herbs grown on escape ladders to large-scale community gardens, it is now possible to find all kinds of fruits and vegetables grown right here in the heart of New York City. So I was living in this neighborhood on the Lower East Side, and it was one of a bunch of neighborhoods in New York City that had essentially been really devastated in the 1970s when uh, buildings were abandoned and burned down. And, Landlords even set fire to their own buildings to get insurance money. And so uh, there were whole neighborhoods where a quarter or a third of the housing was leveled. And what was left was vacant lots full of rubble and trash. And people who were living in those neighborhoods essentially took it upon themselves to clean up the lots and in many cases grow food. So they created these kind of little tiny spots of urban farms in some neighborhoods where that were just dotted with these um, urban farms where people were keeping chickens and growing vegetables and living off the land. And who did these lots belong to? The city owned the lots and eventually developed a program where people could gain ownership to the lots. They could pay a dollar a year and garden. This is 
is the biggest city in the United States, and people don't imagine it as full of growing things, but in fact it is. Uh, there are at least 500 beehives uh, in rooftops and in community gardens and in backyards in New York City. Um, there are hundreds of community gardens. People are growing things in their backyards and on their fire escapes and on their roofs. Do people still fish here? I heard when the first settlers arrived in the 1600s that there were oysters galore and this was uh, basically a very fertile land, farming paradise. It was incredibly fertile land. It's hard to imagine New York City that way now, but in the 1600s when the first Dutch settlers arrived, it was kind of this beautiful land that could have become a, a national park. The waterways are more diverse than almost any place in, in the country. Um, the, they had enormous lobsters and oysters and all kinds of fish. It's kind of amazing because for many years in New York's history, uh, people knew the city for its oysters. They would say, if somebody was visiting New York City, they would say, enjoy the oysters. Uh, those days are gone. Even if you go back to the early 1900s, people were growing things on the roofs. Roofs are a great resource because they are flat land that has great access to sun, which is in short supply in Manhattan. So people have always found ways to grow things there. Uh, the, the question in the future will be, are there actually enough roofs that can support that kind of major agriculture? Because if, if we can find ways to, to build buildings that can uh, support that kind of weight, it could be a great resource. Hello, my name's Heidi. My name's Kawasi, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> when you saw this vacant lot that was full of trash and old car parts. I decided to make it into a garden. We needed something green. We didn't have all these trees we have today. It became a place of therapy. It became a place for food, for fun, for relaxation. It opened up a whole new world. At a time on this block, people wouldn't even say good morning. They would chew you out if you look at them. That totally changed. We had crackheads helping us. We had the police stopping by. Time Warner came. Cable would come in and have lunch. The teachers from the school. It became more than just a garden. It became a community. I've heard about your preserves. I'm off the hook. Now, I don't know if you can see that good, but this is plum sauce. It's one of the best things you can eat. And I made it from the plums from this tree. Made in yeah. Harlem. <laughs> Only the best. When I first moved to New York in the 1990s, I lived in a neighborhood that was largely Puerto Rican. And uh, people kept chickens in New York City just as they had in Puerto Rico. They found little vacant spaces between buildings and essentially built farms and used the chickens for eggs and made chicken soup. And um, more recently, it became something that had wider appeal and people were kind of just attracted to the idea that they could keep chickens in the backyard and come home from a day at the office and clean out the chicken coop and wake up in the morning, gather the eggs and make scrambled eggs for breakfast. So here's some eggs that were laid this morning. For me, I could trade it within my community for something that has value to me. Um, but yeah, we're, we're totally like rich in eggs most of the time. We get about 23 eggs a week from four hens. So that's, that's pretty good output. Beekeeping actually just became legal uh, in 2010. So it's just been a couple years of legality, but even before that, people were still keeping bees. So these are the beehives, and these bees have this amazing view of the Manhattan skyline. And when they fly out, they can decide if they want to go into midtown Manhattan to get nectar. And there's also something really amazing about honey because essentially you're tasting the city. You know, the bees go off and they are foraging in traffic islands or in window boxes and you can taste what they bring back. Here we've got tons of linden trees. They're everywhere and right now they're blooming. And so we walked down the street, you could smell them and bees love them and it really impacts the flavor. I've actually taken it upstate to a beekeepers association meeting where everyone was sharing honey and everyone was like, oh, this is really good. And, I was, and they're like, where'd you, where'd you keep your bees? And I was like, uh, Brooklyn and they were just like silent, <laughs> dead silent. No, no one who keeps bees up in the country wants to hear that Brooklyn honey tastes better than, than theirs. New Yorkers, stubborn and creative, work tirelessly to improve their city. 
Together they make it more beautiful, more functional, and more enjoyable. It's easy to understand why people from all over the world and all walks of life continue to converge to this beautiful metropolis. The outstanding cost of living has driven many New Yorkers away from the city. But in exchange, they've given the suburbs a new life and a new identity.